Today I'm going to do um, 3D printing. I've um, uh, basically creating solid objects, uh, three-dimensional objects out of um, data. Um, it's different. I mean, if you're working with wood, you're taking usually taking away, so it's a, a destructive. You, you're taking a bit of block of wood and carving something to produce something or stone. With 3D printing, you start with nothing and then layer it up like like um, icing on a cake. You know, you squirt it out or icing on a cake, and it slowly builds it layer by layer by layer. Um, so you build objects from the bottom up. So the printer starts at the bottom with an uh, extruding head, just like icing a jet on a cake, and then very slowly builds that up layer by layer by layer. And you, you do that by um, designing a... a, a th designing or scanning in or producing a three-dimensional mesh, it's called, which is dots in, in 3D space. Uh, and um, you send that to the printer and tell it that printer to print that. So this is a scan of my daughter's face. And then um, you can see that it's a sort of mesh uh, that comes into the computer, just saying that that point in space is here and that point in space is here. Uh, and that then is taken and sent to the printer as something called G-code, which is basically telling the squirt heads on the top of the printer exactly where to be at what point. Puts a bit of uh, um, plastic usually down, but it can be any material, and then layer by layer builds, uh, builds it up. Um, it's being used all over the place right now, so it's, uh, you'll see it involved in um, food and drugs and medical equipment and reconstruction. So... Um, uh, body parts or uh, um, prosthetic limbs. You also use in the medical profession for um, reconstruction. Uh, it's now getting to the point where they're building up meshes to actually print uh, cells and human tissue layer by layer. This is a sort of early prototype of an ear that they're printing up. So there's complete amazing technology jump in this space and it's moving very, very quickly indeed. And you know, there, if, there's lots of things that can be printed in three dimensions. Um, such as, for example, pull that back. Uh, you can use any lots of materials. You can use plastic, which is the most common one, but you can use synthetic resin, concrete. Uh, in fact, I was reading just yesterday that there is a prototype um, construction that allows you to squirt concrete in layers. So you just basically can build houses layer by layer. So you you know you can imagine this thing squirting the concrete in rows like this and then building the next layer and building the next layer. So you can uh, actually construct. And there's even talk about doing that sort of construction method um, on the moon by using uh, rock resin, etc. Uh, and you can get increasingly sophisticated um, objects with 3D printing. And in fact, with 3D printing, you can produce objects that are very, very difficult or almost impossible to produce any other way because of the interleaving pieces that you can print in one print uh, as it you can have bits inside of it which you could not construct uh, by um, doing it with metal or wood. Um, this, for example, is printed using something called a powder printer. Uh, Tim at the IQ store has got one of these. Um, and what, how that works is you get a layer of powder and it uses like an inkjet printer with lots of heads on it and prints a layer of ink over the top of the powder then puts another layer of powder over the top of that, prints another layer of ink and builds up this sort of object layer by layer uh, in the printer. Then you kind of take all the powder away and you use a resin and you firm it up and you, you produce something like this. Um, they're also using it to build drugs and organic, uh, organic things where they're putting layers of um, e even almost molecular layers layer by layer down uh, and uh, printing um, you know, completely new concepts like organic drugs. Um, Bioprinting using uh, actual tissue, uh, something called bio ink. Um, whoops, I'm flipping too fast here. Bioprinting, right. The next one. Uh, but the main thing that I use it for is um, <coughs> constructing the objects with CAD software, and I'll show, uh, demonstrate that to you upstairs if you want to have a look at it. Um, and you basically can build. Each of these finger parts, etc., are designed individually, printed individually, and then put latched together. And so you can actually build some quite amazingly sophisticated things. So that hand, for example, is here. Um, and you can see that each individual part is 3D printed on the, on the printer. Um, and then put together using some fastenings and some screws. And you, know, you can create things from literally nothing, 
conceive them in your head, uh, use a bit of CAD software and create them uh, and then print them out. So it's a great thing, um, you know, I'm encouraging schools to be putting these in as much as I can, uh, encouraging, because I think it's a very creative thing and it, it allows you to um, conceptualize something and then uh, make it actually physically exist uh, within just a few hours. Um, so this is a sort of making idea. So I've, uh, I'll sh again, I've got all this upstairs so you can have a look at it, but you use some basic CAD software and you have a particular design problem or a design issue uh, and you can um, design something to fit that issue. So for example, this is a quadcopter and these things are quite difficult to land on the legs that come with them by, by default, which are about that high. And I wanted to be able to fly this around quite fast and land it uh, in any conditions. So these, all of these legs here are individually are designed in CAD. I can show you that upstairs. So you just draw it and extrude it uh, and uh, print it out in 3D. So you can you know, design a brand new thing as you wish. So upstairs as well, I've got the remote controller. And this is a, a mount for the screen on the remote controller for the quad. Um, I was at uh, Tim at the IQ Stores workshop yesterday. He's designed all sorts of things with his printer for um, <coughs> putting latches on things and using it for uh, measuring, etc. So it, you can use them for very much practical use uh, and get a uh, get something out of it and create things. And what I've done with all of these, and what you tend to find in the community, is that you publish them. Uh, there is various websites where you can put these things up and let other people have them. So you design um, whatever you want and then you make them readily available as a file and then they can download that file and print it out on their printer. So this, some of those designs, just the, the skid, skid things for the quadcopter and the mounts for the screens uh, have been very popular and lots of people have uh, taken uh, my design and then printed it out for, on their printers or slightly modified it to suit them and printed it out. So it's a very sort of community share type of idea as well. Um, okay, so that's, that's basically 3D printing. And if there's anything you want to know about CAD, 3D printing, uh, the software that is used, the types of printers that are around, and what you can do, then, then do come upstairs and ask me, and I'm happy to just talk you through that and tell you the sorts of things that I uh, mess around with. Uh, now I'm going to move on to scanning. Um, so... That basically is, uh, instead of creating with the CAD software a design like you've seen with the hand or the quadcopter pits, this is taking images that exist in the world and digitizing them, turning, in, turning them into 3D parts uh, in the, inside of the computer. And there's various ways of doing that. One of uh, these ways is structured light scanning. And that really, that's quite simple, in fact. It, it involves a projector, just like the projector we're using here, and a, uh, a small camera, just like the ones you use for video conferencing or you might have on your portable. Um, and you line them up in the right sort of way and you use some very clever software that projects onto the image uh, a series of lines uh, and it knows the angles between, the distance between the projector, the object, and the camera on the object and does the maths to work out exactly where things are when it does the projection. And then it's able to uh, uh, reconstruct the object in 3D. Now, obviously, what you need to do with that um, is to rotate the object on a little rotation. So you just take a scan of it, rotate it a bit, take another scan and another scan, and you keep doing that, and then the software meshes it all together to create your full three-dimensional object. So here is uh, an object, and you can see there's ma many scans of the object from different angles. It then, the software takes that uh, together and meshes it into one object, in three dimensions and then you can use some other software to clean it up a little bit and then finally put it in the print software to print it out so you can get uh, complete replicas that's kind of fun so this item which you'll see upstairs is a uh, brass uh, sculpture that I bought in Amsterdam 20 years ago it's one of a kind there isn't another one of them in the world uh, and by me scanning in I now have a digital copy of that object and should it get lost stolen or, or, or um, even if I want a reproduction of it, uh, I can just either send it to be 3D printed in metal, which you can also do, or I've printed it myself on my plastic printers and I've got an exact replica of this object, um, which to me, uh, you know, I quite like the whole concept of being able to turn something that is unique into, into uh, a digital object and then able to make copies and have backups of it, essentially. And today, later on, uh, we have uh, upstairs 
hidden away at the moment, the Marathi Cup. So if you know what the Marathi Football Cup is, it's 110 years old. It is totally unique and quite difficult to uh, reproduce. And I'm going to use some of these technologies to scan the Marathi Cup in, uh, in three dimensions, so we have a digital backup of our Marathi Cup. And then I'm going to attempt to 3D print it, a miniature version of the Marathi Cup. Um, they have asked me if, if they can uh, have an exact copy so that they can give that to the footballers when they're waving it around rather than the original. Um, so we'll see what we do. So I'll be setting that up uh, later today and we'll give that a go. Um, there are some challenges, not least of which it's very shiny, so the lasers tend to bounce off all over the place. So we've got to try and work out how to combat that. Um, so that's, uh, that's one method of scanning. And this again, um, as you can see, I had my daughter close her eyes because <laughs> it's quite bright, but I scanned her in, her head in, and I did some work to uh, clean up the model and then printed out her head in 3D. And again, that's upstairs to have a look at. Um, okay, so there are other methods. So this is the laser scanning. So this is the Marathi cup, and I'm using uh, a laser scanner uh, this, this afternoon to scan that all in uh, and then uh, produce it in 3D, as I was saying. Um, okay, some other methods. Uh, hang on, I seem to have missed my slides up, so I'll go to this one. Uh, another method, so there's, um, the, what I'm doing with the Marathi Cup is I'm using a laser scanner, so it shines a laser onto the object uh, and it can work out distances and then can reconstruct the object in three dimensions. Uh, the one I showed you with the projector uh, is another method. And this is a third method uh, called photogrammetry. Uh, now, how that works is that you take uh, about 30 or 40 pictures of an object and if you've got a smartphone, uh, an Apple phone, for example, you can just uh, type into the App Store and look for something called Catch123. It's free software. Uh, and you can use that software to take pictures of any object, um, maybe about 30 or 40 pictures. Uh, and it will then send that off to be processed and it will come back with a three-dimensional mesh of that object, um, which is kind of cool. And it's free. Uh, it's also a PC software and Apple versions of the software. You can download again free of charge. So what I've done here in mixing my sort of things that I like messing around with, one of which is drones, so I thought, well, that kind of works quite well for objects. You know, you take 20 pictures, you use this software, it turns it into a three-dimensional mesh, and you could print it out. So I thought, well, can I get away with that with some very large objects? So what I've done here is fly the drone with a camera attached around the, one of the Martello Towers, and I've taken about 70 pictures of the tower, um, all the way around the tower. Uh, and this is the, the camera track used, so this is the quadcopter flying around the tower and taking a picture, and then another picture, and then another picture, etc., up into about 70 pictures. Then I've used Catch123, the free piece of software you can download, and I've uploaded all the pictures into that and asked it to reproduce me a three-dimensional model, which it does here. So it, it generates the mesh, it's called, a three-dimensional object in the computer program. And I use some control software to get it to fly um, in, a, in a proper circle around the tower. Then once I did that, I cleaned it up a little bit using some CAD software or some mesh software. And then I asked Tim on his powder printed printer, which is color printed, of course, to so get an exact printed out replica of the Martello Tower, uh, which is apps dimensionally perfect course and the colors perfect because it's using the, the actual photography to color the tower and you can even see that because the towers the light was shining on the sun was shining on the tower this way and it was shaded at the back so you can see the shading at the back so you get a perfectly correct dimensional uh, replica of the Martello tower which I kind of thought was just fun uh, to be honest with you uh, and it allowed me to use all the things that I like messing around with which was drones a bit of photography bit of CAD, a bit of 3D printing, um, so that was kind of a fun thing to do. Now, um, we also did this, or I also did this with, uh, on a very cold Tuesday with my wife moaning at me about it. Um, we were standing about here on the, on the uh, German tower that's uh, out on the north coast, and again, I flew the drone around it, and you can see all of the pictures, or some of the pictures that I took of the drone, and then I uh, got it into a mesh. I can show you all this upstairs if you want to see that. Uh, so I, again, then printed it out on one of my mono um, printers, and you've got an exact replica of the German tower out um, <coughs> on the north coast. <coughs> and again, it's uh, dimensionally perfect. It's an exact replica of the tower, and it can be scaled to whatever size uh, you want. 
Um, so that was kind of fun and the sort of things you can do and it's not, it's not too hard to do. Another thing, um, again, messing around with drones and with 3D printing is we were doing some work with the search and rescue team to use the drones to fly out and do a search for a, um, uh, a body, I mean, obviously a, uh, a dummy that they put, uh, put in off the cliffs of uh, Portland. And we were using the drones to see if we could find them and see if that's a practical way of enhancing the tools that the search and rescue people have for finding people if uh, around the cliffs or in the, in the coastal waters. And it was a good exercise. It worked quite well. And I'm currently messing around with the idea of using something called AIS tracking, which means that I could drop uh, an object uh, onto where we see somebody through the camera on the uh, drone, uh, and that will send out a signal and tell us exactly where they are, even if they're drifting in the currents. So it, it's really just a research project that I'm working with Digital Jersey on. Uh, it's a bit of fun for me at the moment. Um, German Tower, and what have we got next? Oop. And lastly, uh, just a few things on the Internet of Things, yet another thing I like messing around with. Um, so these are devices. You'll see a few of these upstairs being used in various ways, a bit like the Lego stuff. Uh, and these are cards and uh, programmable um, uh, pieces of uh, kit that you can use for various uh, things. So these are Raspberry Pis, but you can some, get something called an Arduino. And that allows you to build um, little devices uh, that do various things. This is a, a sort of movement sensor tool. Uh, and little plug-ons allow you to control things, turn them on and off, etc. Um, now, mixing that with 3D printing, uh, again, I can show you upstairs, you can use those to, for example, control the robot hand here. Uh, these are servos, and you have to pull a uh, cap gut on the fingers to allow the, the fingers to move. These wires come out to somewhere, and you've got to put power into the motors to get the fingers to move. You plug those into these programmable cards or computers or the Raspberry Pis. You do a little bit of programming, and you can get the fingers to move, and, uh, and you, know, you get physical movement with the object. So, um, that allows you to do all sorts of things. So part of the piece of work that we're doing with the dropping uh, objects from the drone in order to um, do search and rescue is that I've got to build, using one of these cards, a device that knows when to release uh, the object, etc. So a variety of ways you can do this. Uh, and, you can, and most of these things now are internet connected, so you can control them via the internet. So moving on to that, this is an Arduino card. Again, these are about 20 pounds and great fun to just mess around with. Uh, we're encouraging the schools to put as many of these in as possible and get their kids to um, think of things that they'd like to do and program them. And there's an, this device here is sort of internet connected and is a controlling device and a censoring device. And I use that one uh, with my fish tank to make sure that um, the temperature is correct and all, and all that sort of thing. Um, and then you get software, in this case, on your iPhone. Uh, and these are things, in, if you want to get into this in an in easy way without having to get into all the electronics, this is something called a Wemo. They're sold at Tim's store, at the, I, uh, the IQ store, the Apple store. Um, and they're a plug that will connect into your Wi-Fi network at home. And then you can use your mobile phone <coughs> to um, control the power, turn the power on and off too. So simple things like lamps, but lights, uh, 3D pin, uh, printers, pumps, anything that you want to control in the house. Uh, but then you can connect that up to something called um, uh, if, if That Then Do This, which is a piece of software, uh, a cloud piece of software that you can again, again get on your phone or your PC. And then you can have status. So you can say, uh, based on whether or not it is um, you know, dawn, turn this light on on the outside or this light on in the inside. Um, if the temperature reaches this much, then put the heating on. All of these sorts of control ideas. And it's kind of fun to just mess around with that, and, it's, and it gives you a sort of taster of where the world is going around this idea of Internet of Things as you get more and more control in your car, in your house, uh, and in your everyday world uh, over what's going on, and you get sensors everywhere. That's really what the Internet of Things is. 
is that there are sensors and there are control devices coming. Uh, and this gives you a, a chance, if you're interested, in just playing around with that and um, seeing where things are going. But these will start to become smaller and cheaper, will be built into, or are being built into light bulbs by default, or into your fridge, so you know uh, if the food's going off or uh, what temperature things are, into your heating control systems. It will be uh, right the way through uh, your, our lives in the next 10 or 20 years. And this is some early, um, early area of that stuff. In this recipe, for example, I was doing a demo where when you came anywhere near the office with your mobile phone, because your mobile phone knows where you are, it's talking up to the cloud to the software that's the recipe software. It knows you're coming towards the office. It, it knows that you're within uh, 50 yards of the office and turns some lights on and turns your computer on and does some things. So just messing about, really. So I, I had it, so as I came in to do the demo, everything turned on for me automatically as soon as I got near the demonstration equipment. Uh, extremely geeky, but you know, what, what, what can I say? Um, and uh, this is sort of, uh, this is also just, uh, just to see how uh, prolific this is going to get. This is my car. Uh, it's a, a BMW, and all BMWs now come with a uh, SIM in it, so it actually is communicating to the internet all the time. Uh, and the car knows where it is. So if you lose it, which shouldn't happen in Jersey, really, but, you know, uh, it, it'll tell you, you can go on your mobile phone, it'll tell you I'm here, and you can find your car. Uh, but you can also turn the aircon on if it's a bit, bit uh, hot or cold, um, and you can change the climate, etc. So this is, this is kind of a, just a demonstration of where things are going in terms of this idea of Internet of Things, where you'll be able to control and sen put sensors in your home, in your car, in your workplace, etc. Uh, and everything will be more connected up up, as in that's what the Internet of Things.